Okay, it's three minutes after, so I think it's a good time for us to start. So welcome to our, uh, our second virtual Lupus Health Conference of 2024, presented by the Lupus Foundation of Northern California. I'm Tom Bakewell, the Executive Director of LFNC. Thanks for spending part of your Saturday with us, and we're excited to welcome each of you back to our free Lupus Health Conference. We've got a couple of great sessions lined up for today. We're planning our next conference for May 4th. Details are on our website. Also, don't forget that May is Lupus Awareness Month. Check out our website to learn how you can help bring awareness to lupus by requesting your city, town, or county to declare it Lupus Awareness Month. We've got emails and, and letters ready to help you uh, if you'd like to use them. Also, mark your calendars for May 10th. It's Lupus Awareness Day. Wear purple that day and share about lupus on your social media accounts. We'll be uh, sharing special posts on our social media. Feel free to share them with your friends and family members. And speaking of uh, raising lupus awareness, we're really excited to announce our 30th annual Outrun Lupus 5K on September 21st, 2024 at Campbell Park. You can sign up now as registration is open. This will also be a hybrid event, so you can join us from anywhere you live in Northern California or beyond. Start thinking about forming a team so we can really help raise lupus awareness and help us outrun lupus. Go to our, our website in the events section to find out more details. So let's get on to the conference. We've got a packed schedule to get today. I'll go over the agenda quickly and then we'll get started. Both of our presenters have joined us before and, and we're thrilled to welcome them back. In the first session this morning, we'll have a presentation from Dr. Tanya Riviera. She will discuss lupus diagnosis and treatments. Dr. Riviera treats complex autoimmune conditions in outpatient and inpatient settings. She's qualified to treat all rheumatological conditions all forms of arthritis, other autoimmune and inflammatory disorders, as well as osteoporosis. She also has a specialized interest in lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Bouchette's disease, psoriatic arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, gout, and fibromyalgia. In our second session this morning, we're going to welcome Tanya Freirich. She's, she's a registered dietitian nutritionist based in North Carolina. Tanya owns and operates a virtual private practice that serves people living with lupus and other autoimmune diseases and can be found online as the Lupus Dietitian. As always, each of our sessions will end with a 15 minute Q&A. Uh, so remember you can post your questions at any time. Uh, we'll be gathering the questions and asking them after the appropriate presentation. You can also ask your questions anonymously by clicking, clicking the anonymous button. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. <laughs> Dr. Tanya Riviera. Dr. Riviera was born and raised in Chile. After receiving medical school and internal medicine residency, Dr. Riviera chose to work in rheumatology research. Dr. Riviera received her rheumatology fellowship training at the New York University Hospital for Joint Disease. During her fellowship training, she continued to work in research studies, focusing on the treatment of lupus nephritis and lupus with pregnancy. She worked for years with Dr. Jill Bion in the research registry for neonatal uh, lupus. This registry was established to investigate the origin of neonatal lupus and to help in the counseling of mothers of children with neo neonatal lupus. Prior to moving to San Diego, Dr. Riviera was working at an osteoporosis center in Princeton, New Jersey. Dr. Riviera's interest in osteoporosis has made her research for the newest med medicines available in the market and future medicines, which are still under investigation. She is certified by the International Society of Clinical Dentitometry. I struggle with that with even with three cups of coffee. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Riviera. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending this webinar today. Um, so I'm here in San Diego, California. And today I'll talk about uh, mainly symptoms and diagnosis of lupus. I was not going to be talking about treatment. Uh, that could be maybe a future uh, webinar. So a little bit of, um, wait a oh, here it is. So a little bit of a definition of what lupus um, actually is. So it's a chronic inflammatory disease. There's a lot of inflammation happening and chronic usually means more than three months in someone's life, consecutive three months. It's a disorder of the immune system it's an autoimmune condition where the person has antibodies against itself, which is damaging different organs, as I'll show in, in 
in a future life. There's an interaction of some genetic factors, some hormonal factors, and environmental factors that play a role. And today we'll talk about the systemic lupus erythematosus. There are other types of lupus that we won't be talking about those today. One is just the skin lupus. A lot of people have just skin disorder called discoid lupus that has nothing to do with organ involvement. And the other type is a drug-induced lupus. Some uh, medications may induce lupus-like uh, syndromes that are a little bit milder than the real systemic lupus. Briefly, history of lupus. Lupus is a Latin word for wolf, and it was described because the, the lesions on the skin were similar to those of um, beaten by wolves. Around 1851, the term erythematosus was introduced, and that essentially means red. And again, it's because of the skin lesions being red. And then Osler, later on, he described other manifestations or symptoms, and that's what we will talk about in a second. So this is a really busy slide about epidemiology, but essentially this is an easier way to look at it. Essentially 85% or more of women are affected with lupus compared to men. It's usually more prominent to see in Native American, African American and Hispanics versus Caucasians. It's usually seen when someone is in the fertile age, so younger women. And there's like a 50-50% chance to get organ involvement with lupus. As we said before, there's genetic, there's hormones, environmental. So genetic, it means that it, it is within the cells, it is in your DNA, but something else, it could be a virus, it could be stress, it could be a surgery, something in the environment triggers along with the hormones and triggers the symptoms of lupus. There's a preclinical stage meaning that sometimes patients don't have any symptoms, but they may have some markers in their blood, what we call autoantibodies that are seen in lupus. So those people we usually just monitor and see. We don't know if 100% of them are going to develop lupus, and so far there's no medication to prevent it from happening. Some of the symptoms, and this is a, a picture of, I think it's supposed to be a woman, but some of the symptoms could be very vague, like having fatigue, recurrent fevers, weight loss, and others are more um, in different organs. So we'll be talking about different manifestations. So these are going to be the mucocutaneous manifestations. So what's happening in the, uh, in the skin, for example. So hair loss in scalp, and it could be with or without scarring of the scalp, the skin of the scalp. Malar erythema, what it means is that butterfly rash. So it's usually your cheeks get really red and it almost looks like, I usually tend to ask the patients, do you have an allergy to the sun? Because it usually occurs after being exposed to the sun. And it's almost like they're allergic to being exposed to the sun. They're in the sun and they get the sunburns that last two, three days, which is not normal ulcers inside the mouth. So there's skin lesions inside the mouth, um, but they're usually not painful. So if someone says they're painful, that could be something else. Sometimes we have something called afters or sores that are viral or triggered by food. But in lupus, these sores are usually not painful and usually at the top of the, the roof of the mouth. There are other skin lesions. There's one called subacute or deep cutaneous lupus and uh, the discoid that I was talking about before. It's called discoid lupus, and we'll look at some pictures. It's called discoid lupus because it's round. So this is what hair loss may look like. So it's not like you're losing one or two hairs, or some people may lose hair because of vitamin deficiency, or they're dyeing their hair, or it's very normal to see it right after delivery of a baby too. But this is like a profound, uh, chronic, severe hair loss that, you can see in the picture, they're like patches that are completely bald. This is the butterfly rash. So it's usually on top of the nose and then around the cheeks. And it could be as mild as this. It's usually raised. You see how it's raised. And it could be painful and like a burning sensation. This is another one here. 
These are the sores that we may get inside the mouth, some of them. So it could be as severe and big as this one, or it could be just one or two smaller lesions. A more severe butterfly rash. And this is discoid lupus, which is like round uh, lesions. And it could be the face, but it could also be other parts of the body, including the skull and forearms or arms. Discoid is because of the it's circular and round. So those are the skin manifestations or symptoms that lupus patients may have. In terms of musculoskeletal, we talk about muscles and joints. So 90% of the patients are going to have something that we call non-erosive arthritis. So erosive, it means that over time, after hurting for many, many months, it's going to cause an erosion in the bones. So that's what happens in rheumatoid arthritis, and that leads to deformities of, for example, hands or different joints. But in lupus, it's non-erosive. So it's not going to cause bone destruction. It's not going to cause deformities of the joints. The other manifestation that we see is muscle weakness. So people may have soreness of the muscles, inflammation of the muscles, weakness of the muscles, and this is throughout the body. So upper extremities, lower extremities, and usually recurrent and chronic as well. This is what inflammatory arthritis would look like. So there's inflammation, this fullness of different parts of the hands in this case that look bigger than normal, tender to touch, unable sometimes to make a fist, usually worse in the morning. So they wake up after not moving for a while and they feel that they're not able to make a fist. They're not able to bend their hands or grab anything. They have weakness as well because of the pain and the tightness that they may feel. So usually worse when they're not moving. So that's why we say usually worse in the mornings. And sometimes it gets easier throughout the days. Patients may get um, their hands under warm water and that may give them more mobility and less pain. Uh, and also moving them throughout the day may make them easier to move. There's something called vascular manifestation. What's happening in the veins and the arteries. So very commonly seen Ray notes phenomenon. And um, I think I do have a picture of that. That is usually when fingers, usually fingertips, but it could be toes, it could be nose, it could be ear. They get really pale bluish coloration when they're exposed to the cold. So it's not that you have cold hands, it's that they change color completely to pale, to blue, there's not enough circulation to the toes in this case or fingers. And that could be associated with tingling sensation and with numbness. So you don't feel them anymore or you feel tingling in those areas. There's another type of symptom that's called necrotized vasculitis. We see different red spots throughout the skin and they could be arterial or venous thrombosis. So clotting disorder. There's something very commonly seen in patients with lupus called um, secondary antiphospholipid syndrome, where there are clotting of the legs, there's a clot in the pulmonary artery and recurrent miscarriages. But usually the recurrent miscarriages happen because the clotting inside the placenta. And by recurrent, we mean at least three miscarriages and after 12 weeks of pregnancy. So this is an example of Raynaud's phenomenon. So there is pale coloration of the fingers on the left, pale coloration of the toes on the right, usually exposed to the cold. This is what vasculitis may look like. Lots of red spots in their hands. It could be the legs. Cardiopulmonary manifestation. So what's happening in the heart and the lungs. So in the heart, we can see something called pericarditis which is inflammation of a layer outside the heart. And it could be with or without an effusion. And by that, I mean with or without fluid around the heart. That is the most common cardiac manifestation in about 20 to 30% of the patients. So out of 10 patients with lupus, about three of them may have this manifestation. The symptoms may be shortness of breath, pressure in the chest, not necessarily pain, but pressure. And it could be with or without fevers. Myocarditis is very rare, and it has to do with the actual heart being inflamed. The first one, pericarditis, is the layer around the heart. Myocarditis is actually the muscle of the heart. 
It can also cause shortness of breath, chest pain, and fever. And there's a valve condition. Inside the heart, we have different valves. And one of them could get inflammation. And it's usually seen in people who have antiphospholipid syndrome. They develop uh, inflammation of the valves. Uh, and it, it's called Lipman sucks. It's just the name, uh, endocarditis of Lipman sucks. And it also causes shortness of breath. And patients can also have coronary heart disease. And that's associated with plaque of atherosclerosis, usually seen in older people or people with diabetes as well. And in here, it would be like a younger female who just was diagnosed with lupus and she's having a heart attack very unusual in, in young women, but it could be because of the lupus. And again, the symptoms are going to be shortness of breath or pressure of the chest, especially the left arm. So as you see the symptoms, when there is the, the lungs and the, and the heart involved, most of the time it's gonna be shortness of breath, pressure in the chest. So with those, those two symptoms are very important to tell your rheumatologist, to tell your doctor if you're having those symptoms, because it could be any of this. So we don't know just by uh, saying shortness of breath and pressure of the chest, we don't really know what, what's underneath, what's happening. Here's just an example of what fluid around the heart may look like. On the left, we see a normal heart shape. And on the right, the heart, which is at the center of the slide, looks a little bit bulgy or bigger. It's because there is uh, fluid around it. And these are some of the pulmonary problems. So similar to what's happening in the heart with the pericarditis, which is the layer around the heart, we have pleuritis, which is the layer around the lungs that could be inflamed. And it could be with or without um, effusion, which is the fluid. And is the most common uh, symptom in patients with lupus who have pulmonary symptoms, about 45 to 50% of the patients. When is the lungs, usually shortness of breath is present, but also pain when breathing deeply. So taking a deep breath is gonna be a problem when someone has pleuritis. There's something called lupus pneumonitis. In this case, one of the symptoms that is more unique would be low oxygen. And you can tell that by, I mean, in severe cases, you can see the lips turning blue. And if you were to take the oxygen level, we did that during COVID a lot, like people were buying those um, oxygen monitors, and then you would see low oxygen, which would be anything below 90, 92% of oxygen. That is abnormal. Pulmonary hemorrhage, it means that there is bleeding inside the lungs. It's very, very rare. Um, what's unique about this one would be blood in the phlegm. So people start coughing and they cough up blood. Sometimes it could be just a little bit. Sometimes it could be a lot. This is very, very urgent. If you're bleeding in the lungs, you need to go see a doctor right away, go to the emergency room. It could be fatal. Most of the time, these, they, these patients need to be intubated. So they have to be with a tube to help them breathe. Another manifestation or symptom is interstitial pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary hypertension. Again, shortness of breath, as you see, is the main symptom and it could be affecting the lungs. It could be affecting the heart. Very important to see your doctor. Um, this is a similar picture as before. And I, can you see uh, the arrow? Because this is a normal lung on the left. But on the right side, you see that there is what's called a pleural effusion. So there is a uh, fluid in that corner of the lungs instead of being clear as the normal x-ray would be. More rare manifestations of lupus or symptoms are going to be problems with the vision. So we have here optic neuritis, retinal vasculitis, uh, thrombosis of the uh, artery of the retina that causes sudden vision loss. Kogan syndrome can cause deafness because it involves not only the eyes, but also the, uh, the ears and the sense of hearing. 
uh, most of the manifestations or symptoms are going to be pain in their eyes, uh, redness and blurry vision or sudden vision loss. There's also gastrointestinal manifestations. So what's going to happen in the bowel, in the stomach? There's intestinal vasculitis. So similar to what we saw in the skin, all these red dots on the skin can also happen in the bowel. Uh, and then it can, as a symptom, it could develop an acute abdomen. That means abdominal pain that is severe and very sudden. As another one called atrophic gastritis, there are some antibodies against the stomach that may be causing, uh, for example, not to absorb a lot of the nutrients. So that could lead to malabsorption. There's autoimmune hepatitis. So we, we know, perhaps we know or we've heard of hepatitis. There are different types of hepatitis. We have the most common one would be the viral hepatitis. So we hear hepatitis A, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. So those are viruses causing inflammation of the liver. In this case, it would be autoimmune hepatitis. So the liver inflammation is caused by your own antibodies, your own body uh, hurting itself. The same um, concept is true for the pancreas. They could be lupus pancreatitis, but there's also inflammation of the pancreas. And uh, they could be an enlarged spleen in about 60% of the patients. A lot of the patients uh, who have lupus may develop anemia and their symptom is gonna be to be tired. So very important to check to make sure they don't have anemia. Anemia and lupus could be because they have this chronic disease. It could be related to some of the medications that patients need to take for uh, lupus. It could be because there's an enlarged spleen. It could be because there's a renal problem, a kidney problem. Or it could be because of something very unique called autoimmune hemolytic anemia, where there's a, a protein that is actually causing the anemia, destroying all the red blood cells needed for the hemoglobin to be transported to different parts of the body. So that was the red cell that can cause anemia. Patients with lupus very frequently have something called leukopenia or lymphopenia. Those are the white blood cells that are low. And that is very common in lupus. Thrombocytopenia is when the platelets are low. Platelets are usually um, the cells in our body that help with healing. Every time we have a cut, they're the ones that repair that cut, the wound that caused the scab. So when we don't have a lot of platelets, prolonged bleeding is going to be one of the symptoms. So for example, you may be brushing your teeth and you may, you're gonna have bleeding from the gums. Or if you have a wound, it's not gonna heal properly, it's just gonna bleed a lot. Uh, people may even have nosebleeds. Th those are kind of the symptoms of having low platelets. Less frequency, uh, frequently, we see neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms, like seizures, for example. I do see a lot of fair enough uh, amount of patients who are young and develop seizures, when they cannot find a, a reason why someone may have seizures and is a, a young female, one of the reasons could be a first symptom of lupus. So seizures, some neuropathy, some cognitive dysfunction, uh, confusion, some people call it a brain fog as well, uh, more severe delirium and psychosis, uh, less frequently, but chronic and hard to treat is going to be headaches. Headaches that don't get better with just using Tylenol, for example, could be a symptom of lupus. And something called chorea, which, has, which are abnormal movements, involuntary, meaning you cannot control them. And it could go all, you know, it could be your arms, it could be your neck, it could be your head, moving without you wanting them to move and in an abnormal way and repetitive. Lupus nephritis. So this is the uh, involvement of the kidneys in lupus. Very important because you may not have any symptoms. It may be picked up in a urinalysis by your primary care. It may be picked up because your kidney function has gone down. So it's very serious because there are no symptoms whatsoever. 
Maybe you don't even know you have lupus. And it's the most common cause of death for lupus if it's not treated and left alone without knowing you have it. You may develop chronic kidney disease and stage renal disease. And those are the patients that are going to need dialysis or kidney transplant. So essentially the kidneys do not function anymore, but that usually happens after years of having a kidney issue. So there's a subclinical disease, meaning there's no symptoms, there's nothing, maybe there's some protein in the urine. And the only way to make diagnosis is going to be by doing a kidney biopsy. So you go to a kidney doctor, they take a piece of your kidney. It's a major procedure, it's not something easy. Um, it has a lot of risks as well. Uh, one of them could be bleeding. And uh, after taking the biopsy, they can detect and see if there is a problem with the kidney and if the kidney problem is actually lupus or something else. Some people may have a kidney issue and they have lupus or diabetes, or they have diabetes and then they didn't even know they have lupus. So the only way in this case is to diagnose a kidney problem would be through the biopsy. Some of the other symptoms, but those are, I have them at the bottom, um, more on end stages, like after years of leaving this um, lupus nephritis, either undiagnosed or untreated, is nocturia, that means going to the bathroom more often at night. Uh, edema, having, for example, people who have, um, a, they're losing a lot of protein in the urine. They could see foamy urine, and waking up in the morning, their um, their eyelids may be swollen, their ankles may be swollen. So a lot of edema, um, sub, like in throughout your body. Another symptom is um, high blood pressure. If someone is young, a woman is is a woman is young in their fertile ages, maybe recently diagnosed with lupus, and have high blood pressure suddenly we have to look at the kidneys and make sure the kidneys are okay. There are different, these are the six different classes of kidney problems. Uh, one, two, and three are mild. Number four is the most dangerous one, but also the most common one because it easily and uh, very frequently progresses into the permanent damage, which is class six, also called sclerosis when at that point there's nothing to do. When someone has class two, three or four, there's still, or five, there's still treatment. Once you reach class six with sclerosis and permanent damage, there's no much that we can do except for um, either dialysis or uh, kidney transplant. This is just a picture of what pathologies would look like when they're doing a kidney biopsy. And some of the tests that, um, rheumatologists or doctors in general may order to try to diagnose lupus. CBC looking at different cell counts, as, as we said before, they may notice that the white cells are low, that there's anemia, maybe the platelets are low. The CMP is going to be looking at your kidney function, if it's normal, abnormal, electrolytes, um, liver enzymes. In, for example, autoimmune hepatitis, the liver enzymes are usually elevated. In the urinalysis, we, we will look at protein. So high amount of protein in the urine is not normal. You should not have any protein in the urine. Your, pro, your urine should not be foamy. Foam means that there's protein. So we look at that in the urine analysis. Protein in the urine, blood in the urine. The other test that a lot of people are very um, worried about is anti-nuclear antibodies, ANA, by immunofluorescent. Um, so ANA could be present in different diseases. I would say 99% of patients who have lupus have a positive ANA, but not a lot of people who have a positive ANA are going to have lupus. In other words, you may have a positive ANA and have, for example, a thyroid problem that is autoimmune, or you may have uh, psoriatic arthritis. So ANA may mean that you have something autoimmune, but it doesn't mean that you have lupus 100%. It could be something else. 
I do see a lot of patients who come to the office with a positive ANA and they have been told they have lupus just because they have a positive ANA. So that is incorrect. Just a positive ANA does not mean that you have lupus. On the contrary, a double-stranded DNA and anti-Smith antibodies, those are very specific for lupus. So if you have a high double-stranded DNA antibody or an anti-Smith, most likely that means that you have lupus. Those two are more important to me than just testing for an ANA. The anticardiolipins antibodies and lupus anticoagulant are going to be the markers for the antiphospholipid or cl clotting disorder that we're talking about. Usually in patients who've had miscarriages, usually in someone young or with no reason for having a blood clot in their legs, in their uh, lungs, and is usually repeated 12 weeks after the first test. So we need to have at least two positive tests to make the diagnosis. Complements, C3 and C4. Those are usually low when lupus is active. So if you wanna know if your lupus is active and you're having symptoms and your complements are low, so most likely it is very active and there is more treatment that needs to be given. If you're having widespread pain, and your complements are normal, most likely there's another reason and it's probably not lupus. And that's the end of it. So we went through the symptoms, we went to the testing, so diagnosis and symptoms, some of the pictures, and um, I'm open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Riviera. Your, your presentation was really informative uh, and I'm sure it's gonna help a lot of us. Uh, so we will now start the Q&A portion of the event. Um, we'll begin with the questions that were asked during the presentation, but feel free to ask additional questions while we're talking. Uh, you know, we, we'll get to as many as we can uh, live, and if, if, and if we can't finish them all, we'll email you the answers to any questions that we're not able to get to today. So we have a few that, that have come up already, and I'll just, I'll read those. Um, I, I guess the, the one that, that's Sort of the most interesting and the shortest question is, can lupus be prevented? Oh, that would be amazing. Um, not that I know of, no, yeah. We do know that there's like, for example, we have a lot of people and when I was working in, in New York, we were following people who had uh, abnormal markers. They had, um, you you mentioned it when, in, when you were introducing me to the audience that, so we had this neonatal registry. Essentially what that was is mothers who had children and the children had neonatal lupus. Um, so then we went back to the mothers and took their test, the blood work and see, okay, these are the markers they have. And about 30% of them actually develop lupus or some kind of disease. But the other 70%, even though they had the markers, they did not develop anything. So it'd be very hard to prevent with, without knowing who's actually going to progress into having lupus. Because you may have the markers, but no symptoms. And that could be true all your life. You may never have symptoms. So do you really want to be taking a medication to prevent something that you may not even get? It's really hard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here, here's a question I'm going to share a little bit too much, I, I suppose. Uh, my mom and my oldest daughter, uh, this is from me, this isn't part of the question, my mom and my oldest daughter uh, have lupus. Uh, and so this question kind of struck home, what if my mom or siblings have lupus? Will I develop it too? So it's a possibility, but uh, we see a lot of family members who may have the ANA positive, for example, and we just monitor them because they may never get the disease. Most family members of someone who has an autoimmune condition are going to test positive for the markers without, no, without symptoms, without having anything. So it's really hard to tell if you are going to develop or anyone who has a family member is going to develop an autoimmune condition just by having the markers. Again, if there are no symptoms, we don't treat. Thank you. The next question that was asked was, uh, does lupus go away with age? If it goes away with age, if, yeah. um, that's a good question, but no, I haven't seen that to be true. It can get into remission. It can get into remission. Um, 
I don't know if it, it doesn't really entirely goes away. It could go into remission on its own. It's very rare, usually with medications. So a new question has come in. Um, you know, CBC is a relatively common blood test. Uh, ANA, not as common, but but it is, it, it, it's a little bit more frequent. Um, but most people have never heard of the, the anti-DNA or the anti-Smith. How do you talk to your doctor about doing that if you come back with a positive ANA? So normally, um, primary care doctors, family doctors, they're normally not testing for those. Normally, I see a few doing the double standard DNA. I think it just has to do with um, how comfortable or how familiar or experienced the doctor, the primary care family doctor is with those tests. Most of the time they get an ANA, it's abnormal, and then they send the patient to rheumatologist. They're like, okay, let's let's get rheumatology involved and then let's see what they want to order. And you know, so it's usually something that a rheumatologist is going to order and not just uh, like a regular doctor most of the time. And then the final question that we have uh, really has to do with with lupus anticoagulant. Uh, and and is that the same? So the first part of the question is, can you speak more about lupus anticoagulant? But the second part is, is it the same as protein S and C deficiency? No, it's different. Lupus anticoagulant is just called that, lupus anticoagulant. And you order it and they do a blood test and they just see, um, essentially what they look at is the time that it takes for your blood to clot. As the name says, anticoagulant is anti-clotting. So if you have it present, that blood is not going to clot. It's going to have a prolonged time. It's going to take longer for the blood to clot. There's something causing the blood not to clot. So the presence of that, that's how they measure it. And then they put different things to try to make sure it's not something else. And then they say, oh, there's a presence of loop. So the way it's, the, the report is, there is a lupus anticoagulant present in blood. Protein S and protein C is different and I'm not 100% very familiar. I don't order that very often. That's more hematologist, but those are deficiencies of proteins that have to do with the coagulation. But um, so they order protein S and protein C and there's a number associated with them. If they have less than X amount, I don't remember the ranges, then there's a deficiency deficiency of the protein S and the protein C. And those proteins are also essential for coagulation, but it's different. This, this is a specific test called lupus anticoagulant. So, so from my uh, untrained ear, what I heard you say was one lupus anticoagulant, you will not clot as quickly as possible, but with protein S and C deficiencies, you will clot faster than you should. No, you wouldn't either, but there's a test that tells you uh, how much of the protein S is in your body, how much of protein C, and if you're deficient or not. Got it. So okay. there's a range. For lupus anticoagulant, there's no range. It's just say you have it or you don't have it. It's present or not present. Thank you. Thank you. These have been great questions, everyone. Thank you. And, and Dr. Riviera, we really appreciate your time and your expertise uh, giving up your Saturday morning for us. Uh, we really appreciate it. So uh, unless there's other questions, we're gonna take a, a quick break and get ready for our second presentation. And not seeing thank any, you. Thank, you so much. thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. So everybody, why don't you grab a, a quick glass of water and we will, it is 11.42, why don't you give us about three or four minutes and we will get the next speaker lined up and, and we will uh, we'll start the, uh, the second presentation.